This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In some traditions they say, sometimes life is unfair, but God is good all the time. It is good to be with you this afternoon. So we will um, grant this moment of worship as we invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit by entering into prayer via song. And this is the Lord's Prayer as set by Sheehan to Chrysanthemum's liturgy. So this is the Our Father and it shall feature both Turning Point and University Choir. is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Now that you've gathered in your seats and you're all so comfortable, will you please rise as we sing our congregational hymn for today. This is Holy, Holy, Holy.
We're really excited about sharing this wonderful hymn of the church with you today. Now you may, I'm sure you've heard this hymn before, but I'm almost certain for most of you in here, you have never heard this arrangement. Uh, this arrangement of this wonderful hymn, which is entitled, Be Thou My Vision. This arrangement has been set by uh, Mr. Andrew DiStefano, a member of Turning Point and our president. And uh, we certainly enjoy singing it, so we, we certainly hope you enjoy as we serve and worship by offering this in the presence of the Lord this afternoon. Don't be alarmed, but this wonderful spiritual I've been buked children is going to feature a bit of a rap. And don't be disappointed if it's not the rap that you think it should be. But it will be appropriate to the setting of the text. This is I've been buked children, an old spiritual of the church as uh, arranged by Mr. Rolla Dilworth. Let's go. 
This is a wonderful psalm of the church. This is Psalm 57. Awake, awake, illusion harp, awake and now the dawn. Yes, a very energetic piece with a wonderful slow moving uh, uh, middle section. Uh, this will feature again Turning Point. We do hope you enjoy it. Praise the Lord for it. Awake, awake, the lute and harp, awake and now the dawn. Awake, awake, my glory, rise to praise the King of heaven. Alleluia, 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 alleluia.
Awake, awake the lute and harp, awake and now the dawn. Awake, awake, my glory rise to praise the King of One of my favorite uh, scenes from the Bible, I wanted to say stories, but that's what it was when we were small growing up in Sunday school, but this is true history, and that is the scene and has found in 1 Kings, I believe chapter 19, with Elijah going against the, the, um, the prophets of Baal and Jezebel's men, and if your God be God, then we'll see, but if my God be God, then you're going to see some terrible things. And it happened at Mount Carmel. So this is entitled Elijah Rock. And this is to depict in the spiritual what happened at Mount Carmel as the Lord lit the altar that was, um, that was just trenched with water and lapped up uh, the, the water with all of the flames. And then Elijah went on to slaughter hundreds of the prophets of Baal. Here is Elijah Rock. Come on, sister, help me to pray. Tell me, my Lord, on pass his way. Elijah Rock. Elijah Rock, 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 Oh, 
University Choir and Turning Point another round of applause for leading us in such incredible worship. <clears throat> Well, good afternoon. My name is Megan Aceto. I am the Director of Student Ministries and Service Learning here at Eastern. Um, I just celebrated my 11th anniversary over the summer, and each year when we do this, I'm so grateful to um, bring our representatives of service and mission organizations to campus, and I'm so grateful to see our students meet with them and engage with them and talk with them as they consider what uh, God might be calling them to do in the next um, season of their life, whether that's this coming summer or after they graduate, um, or maybe taking a gap year after they graduate, something like that. As Eastern enters its centennial year, we are intentionally inviting exceptional alums to campus as our featured speakers for events like Missions Forum and Faith Forum. Um, David Garlock is our speaker today, and I'm very excited to introduce him in a moment. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what Missions Forum is. Missions and immersive service and immersive experiences more broadly um, are about articulating and embodying God's good news to the world and in the world. Gustavo Gutierrez, who wrote the book and many others, A Theology of Liberation, um, who actually just passed away yesterday, wrote this in his book. Neighbor is not whom I find in my path, but rather he in whose path I place myself, whom I approach and actively seek. The idea here, I think, is that certainly we cross the paths of people unexpectedly, but that we are actually called to go out and to be good news in the world to those that we encounter, who are strangers to us right now, but become neighbors to us through our acts of service and loving kindness. Here at Eastern, we believe in graduating students who do just that, who are thoughtful and dedicated and intentional people prepared to share God's love and good news with the world in both word and action. Our mission statement is that Eastern University is a diverse, Christ-centered community preparing graduates to impact the world through faith, reason, and justice. So I'm excited to welcome you to the sort of towards the end of Missions Forum 2024. If you've been around McGinnis today for classes, you might have seen the mission and service agencies we have in the lobby. They'll be continuing um, to spend some time with us after chapel as well. Um, but we want this time to be an opportunity to equip you to do that very thing, to go out and to share God's love in the world, in your words and in your actions. Um, so we'll hear from David Garlock, our speaker. Um, David has been in classrooms, meeting with university leadership um, in lots of different places. We've been having conversations on the path with students um, and in hallways, which has been really wonderful. Um, and I hope that you'll stick around afterwards uh, to meet and talk with some of our mission and service organizations in the lobby as well. Um, this year we have CMF International, Mennonite Central Committee, CCO, Co-Labors International and the NEMA Project. Um, and in addition to hosting these organizations, Mission Forum serves as sort of the jumping point for our Eastern University sponsored immersion experiences. So in um, January or February, I believe, we'll be partnering with CCO to send students to the Jubilee Conference and are working on a number of sort of one day immersion experiences um, in the spring of 2025, which we are very excited about as well. If you are a representative of one of our mission or service organizations, would you stand so we can welcome you and thank you for your presence here today? The rest must be out at their tables. <laughs> I want to also take a moment and uh, thank the Campolo Center for Ministry and the Baugh Family Foundation for their partnership, which enables us to host speakers like David. Um, and again, we invite you to stay after to have some refreshments and chat a little bit, both with David and with our um, representatives. My first encounter with David Garlock was in the very first chapel in the spring semester, January of 2014. I'd only been here at Eastern about six months at that point. David was a brand new student, and he happened to sit down right behind me. And if you know anything about Eastern, our very first chapel of the year is our sort of praise and prayer chapel where people are invited to share something that's been on their hearts. And I don't remember exactly what David said, but I know he said something in that chapel. <laughs> something inspiring and encouraging and challenging probably to all of us. 
He sang with joy. I could hear it behind me. He existed in that space in such a way that I could tell there was something different about him, but I didn't know exactly what it was in that moment. But it was clear to me that David was at Eastern for a particular purpose, both for him and for us. I'd learned before he arrived that we had a student joining us who was coming from recently being incarcerated. And within no time at all, David became an integral part of the Eastern community. He got involved with prison ministry and Yacht, which is our ministry that serves people experiencing homelessness in Philadelphia, and many other student organizations. Now, some of that has to do with who David is, but some of that also has to do with the Eastern community, the kind of welcoming place that we are. I've heard David speak a lot of different places now, <laughs> which is a great joy of mine. Um, and it's always a central tenet of his story, is that Eastern is unique, and he felt like he belonged here because of the welcoming community that we are. The details. David L. Garlock is a formerly incarcerated criminal justice reform advocate and reentry expert. David and his brother received 25-year sentences in Alabama after taking the life of their abuser. A client of Equal Justice Initiative, he was released on parole in 2013 after serving more than 13 years and pursuing several educational opportunities while incarcerated. And then he came to Eastern. Graduated from Eastern uh, with his bachelor's degree in 2017. David's professional experience includes advocacy and reentry program management, with his story and his professional expertise, his voice has made an impact in campaigns to abolish death by incarceration, create geriatric parole programs, and reinstitute Pell Grant funding for incarcerated students. He served as the Lancaster Program Director for New Person Ministries, a reentry program for men who've been convicted of sex offenses and other returning citizens from 2017 to 2020. David graduated from Just Leadership USA's Leading with Conviction Fellowship Program in 2019 as well. David serves on a number of boards and has served on a number of boards, including our Prison Education Program's Advisory Board. He is currently doing research, uh, a research fellowship with Yale um, and Columbia that's focused on vaccinations in prisons. David enjoys educating the next generation of criminal justice professionals on rehabilitation and advocating in various spheres for an effective and equitable justice system. He's a frequent speaker at colleges and universities. I think the current count is over 70. Um, criminal and social justice conferences and community events, and he also appeared in the film Just Mercy. He also did a TEDx at Arcadia University in 2022, and additionally, I've had the honor of teaching with David in Eastern's Prison Education Program, which is an associate's degree granting program at the State Correctional Institution in Chester. It is one of the highlights of my professional career. David received the 2024 Young Eastern University Distinguished Young Alumnus Award as well. David and I have had many encounters since that first meeting in chapel over 10 years ago. He has shown up in my office as Beaker, our mascot. He has <laughs> shared a lot of important milestones. He texted me, might have even called me actually when he got engaged and was getting married. Um, he asked thoughtful questions about his place at the university and in the world. And he's allowed me the space and the honor to walk alongside him in his journey. A perk of my job is that I've met a lot of really incredible people um, through my time at Eastern, but few have impacted my personal perspective and my professional work more than David, which is why I am so, so delighted to welcome him back to Eastern. Thank you, David, so much for joining us. Would you all join me in giving David a warm Eastern welcome? Wow. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? Wow, how am I supposed to go after that? You know, it's like... At times, you know, I hate introductions like that because, you know, there's a lot to talk about. I, I did an event last week, and the person's like, how do you want to introduce me? I'm like, just say my name. You know, just say, this is David, and I'll go from there. Um, it's such a blessing and honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you, Chaplain Modica. Um, let's give another round of applause to Turning Point and the choir. Y'all... Y'all rocked it. Thank you. So when Megan asked me to speak, 
And, and another thing about me is I'm a public speaker, so I'm not somebody who likes to get behind a podium and stand there. I, I like to walk a little bit and look and see you all. So when she asked me about this, I started thinking like, okay, if I'm to speak at a missions chapel, what do I really want to talk about? And then I started thinking about a particular verse. But then when I was thinking about that verse, which we'll get to in a second, I had to come to the Great Commission. So we think about the Great Commission, and we're like, how can we fulfill the Great Commission? And I like props. You know, I like presentations because there's a lot of people that are visual, so it allows you to look at this. But I also like props, you know, so... I have this big box that I got the other day from Amazon. And I was thinking, like, when I got this box, I'm like, this is the Great Commission. So the Great Commission tells us and focuses on that we have to baptize people and go into the whole world, right? So when I think about the whole world, I think about, like, this big box. This is what we have to do. Isn't that daunting when we think about, like, this is what God's called us to do, minister in this huge way? If you saw this box outside your door and you got it, what are you going to think? Like, I might need to call somebody to bring it in for me. (laughs) And it's like, wow, this is what we have to do. This is a great commission. This is our purpose in life to reach all of these people in the world. But the first verse I thought about, when we have to unwrap this, is Jesus talks about it in Acts 1.8. And what does he say in Acts 1.8? Where does he say that we have to go? We have to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's the thing I loved about Jesus is the fact that, you know, he told us, here's the Great Commission, but let me break it down to you. And tell you exactly the people that you have to go to, where you have to go to, and how to reach them. So when we unpack this, I was actually thinking about wrapping this the other day. But as you can see, um, I ran out of tape, so I wasn't able to. So we have this big box. And then we start unwrapping it. And in this big box, we have another box. So what is this? This is the whole world, right? So in Acts 1-8, this would be the uttermost parts of the world. So if we're going backwards on this, what would this be? No, from the uttermost parts to Samaria. Okay, so this is a a bigger box. So when we open up Samaria, what do you think we have? Another box. So what box is this? Judea, okay, y'all, y'all, y'all riding with me now, that's good. So inside Judea, what do we got? We have Jerusalem. So we go from this huge idea of, wow, oh snap, how am I going to minister to the whole world? This is a lot to do. To now we have this point where we have the uttermost parts of the world, but then we have Samaria, then we have Judea, and then we have Jerusalem, and I'm about to trip over that mic. But now we can see it in a different way. Is this as big now? Now is something where we can attain it, we can reach it, we can be involved and impact people. So let's look at these different areas. So when we think about Jerusalem, Jerusalem is our family. Jesus ministered to his family. One of the main places he did that is at the wedding and Cana. So Jesus was at this wedding with his mom and other family members. And what does his mom tell him to do? Make the water into wine. She's like, okay, I know who you are, Jesus. These folks really don't, but here's your time. Go ahead and do this. So he's ministering to his family in this way. We have opportunities to minister to our own families. Some of them might not be saved. Do you always have to go and preach at your family members? No. Sometimes it's just showing them love. Sometimes it's having a Bible study with them. Sometimes it's just praying with them. 
Both my brother and I went to prison for taking the life of the person who abused us. While we were incarcerated, our mom, dad, grandma, and sister all passed away. So really, we're the only immediate family that we have left. The way that I was able to minister to my brother while we were incarcerated in the county jail is we had Bible studies together. Now, that didn't always resonate and stick with him because he's far from the faith. But do you know what? That seed was planted. And that's what we have to do. Uh, uh, Paul wrote that uh, Peter planted Apollos water, but God got the increase. So it's not always about what we see in fruition. It's us just doing that work. I know those, those seeds that I planted are rooted in my brother's heart. And I'm just waiting for it to come to fruition. Then we have Judea, which is a little bit bigger. So your family a lot is smaller. Then you have Judea, which is your community. This community could be different things. You know, in Jesus, when I was thinking about Jesus, you know, I was thinking about feeding the 5,000, which is actually about feeding 13,000, but, you know, they just said 5,000 men. So here he is in this community. He could have easily sent the community away, told them to go get your own food. But what did he do? He ministered to them by providing food for them. How do we minister to our community? I mean, one way that I get to minister to my community is the church that I go to. I get to work with the kids in the elementary. Some people are like, wait, uh, you went to prison and you did all this and they let you work with kids? I'm like, yes, God opened the door for me to get a part in and I've been approved to work with the kids, you know, and I get to pour into these kids at the church I go to. One of the best compliments I ever got was one of the people's mothers. There were two girls. She sent me a message on Facebook. She's like, David, I was having a Bible study with my girls about mentors. And I asked them who their mentors are. And she's like, the youngest one said, Mr. David. I'm like, that like broke me. I'm like, what? Who would think that I would be a mentor, you know? In the natural mind, it's like, yeah, okay. But that's how God allows us to do. That's the impact that God allows us to have, no matter what our past is. You know, I I tell people my life falls into Psalms 40, 1 through 3, where it talks uh, talks about God pulls you up out of the miry pit. He washes you off. He cleans you. He sets you on a rock and gives you a new song to sing, and you're able to impact and empower other people. And that's what I'm able to do with my life, you know? That's how I'm able to have an impact on my community. Where do you think Samaria is as we get into Samaria? Or what are the Samaritans? What? The people not like us. The lepers. The the people that... No one wanted to be around. Because if you know anything about the Samaritans, the Samaritans were half Assyrian and half Jewish. So if you think about the 50s and 60s and you think about biracial children and the way that they were treated, that's exactly the way Samaritans were treated. They were outcasts. They were lepers. No one wanted to deal with them. No one wanted wanted to be around them. But do you know who always wanted to be around them and who wouldn't shun away from them? Jesus. The woman at the well. She had three strikes against her. She was a woman. She was a Samaritan. And she had been with a whole bunch of men. And so in that society, she was scorned. She was looked down upon. But did Jesus look at her past? What did he do? He looked at her future and told her what her future could be. I'm blessed with the opportunity, as Megan said, to go in and to participate in the prison education program here. I've spoken in numerous prisons across the country. When I was a student here, the thing that I loved being a part of and doing was prison ministry and going into Lancaster Youth Intervention Center because I was able to go in there and to tell these young men 
who if they didn't turn their lives around, could end up in prison. I could tell them, hey, I was in prison. It's not some place you want to go. What was amazing about that was in 2018, I was speaking in a class in Millersville University. And there was a student in the back of class raised his hand. He didn't have a question for me, but he wanted to say, David, I remember when you came to Lancaster Youth Intervention Center three years ago. And I was like, wow, the impact that we have. And here's the thing. Our prison ministry wasn't about going in there preaching at these kids. We would play basketball for an hour, and then we would play um, apples to apples and other games like that. We wanted to do time with them. We wanted them to know that, okay, we're not here to really convert you or to preach at you. We want you to be converted, but we're here to do time with you. We're here to love on you because that's what it was about. And us doing that was able to plant those seeds. And if you guys have never been involved with the prison ministry, check it out. It's amazing. And I'm sorry you missed out on an amazing time last night. I actually made some prison food for the kids, you know, and everybody loved it, you know. (laughs) Maybe another time I'll have to come back and we'll spread it out a little bit more. So here we are. We have Jerusalem, which is your family. We have Judea, which is your community. We have Samaria, which is the prisons or ministering to folks on the streets. And then we have everywhere else. Everywhere else, you know, the uttermost parts of the world. I, I think of, when I think about this, I think about Jesus going to the gatherings and he comes across the man who had the legion of demons in him. And this is someplace he hadn't been before, but he went and he healed this man and released the demons and they went into the pigs and the pigs ran into the ocean. When I think about uttermost parts of the world, it's not really talking about you don't have to say, okay, I'm going to Nepal tomorrow or uh, Zimbabwe or China or anything like that. It's anywhere that's outside of these three. So a couple weeks ago, I was able to go to Washington State and speak at a couple universities, and I went into a women's prison there. Do you know what? That's part of the uttermost parts. Because those are areas that I had never gone before and spoken and shared my faith in. One thing about me is every university that I go to and speak, I'm talking about God. Because I'm not where I am without God. All of that happened after I confessed to the crime and I'm heading back to the county jail with the detective. And I'm asking the detective if I'm going to get the death penalty or life without parole. And he turns to me and he's like, do you believe in God? This went back and forth a couple times. But finally I told him, yes, I believe in God. And he's like, you need to seek him now. That whole conversation changed my life. And how could I go somewhere and speak about where and what I'm doing right now if I don't talk about what God did in my life on November 1st, 1999? That's why I'm able to minister to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So what's next? You get to be a witness in these four areas. So what I want you to do as you leave out of here and as we pray and we go is think about your Jerusalem. Think about your Judea. Think about... Where is that Samaria that you would go and minister to and speak to or just spend time with? And then be willing when God opens those doors to go to the uttermost parts of the world. Go places that you're not comfortable with. Because being a Christian isn't comfortable. We're asked to do things we might not want to do at times. But do you know what we have to do? We have to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord... We just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for this amazing time to talk about missions and talk about the way that we can fulfill the Great Commission. Just put it on our heart, Lord, so we're able 
to minister to our Jerusalem. So we're able to minister to Judea. So we're able to minister to Samaria and be, allow us to be willing to go to the uttermost parts of the world. Lord, we just want to be here. We want to say, here I am, send me. Lord, just prepare us, give us the, the will, the understanding of your word, and just show us the people you want us to speak to, place them in our lives, and continue to give us the words where we can be an example and allow us to know that we're worthy, that we're able, and that you're going to be there through it all. So just thank you for everything that you've done, and just continue to work in us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as was said, hopefully you're able to stop outside, talk to some of the folks here that are doing the missions. We'll be outside to talk to. Thank you all for coming, and y'all be blessed. And remember, you got four areas to do some work in.